everybody. This is Tulip. All right, I get it. You're mad. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Cassidy, and I really screwed up this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Cass. <laughs> I have some good things to say about Cass. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. this is uh, this is the good news, the gospel according to AMC's Preacher. We are doing season two, episode five, Dallas. Which premiered on July 17th, 2017. So we're, we're catching up. We're pretty close, man. Yeah. We're within a couple of weeks. The episode is airing tonight. That's right. I had it on record. I, I know. My, I was like, did my best to avoid it earlier. <laughs> I was like, why don't I have last night's episode? Oh, yeah. It's on Monday nights now. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Our numbers are, are a bummer again, and I, I'm going to bring us down by comparing us to Game of Thrones again. <laughs> uh, yeah, and last time, my number was actually pretty high. I found the last episode, like, there was some interesting moments and some funny laugh-out-loud moments, and this episode was a real downer for me. Oh, no, I was talking about our ratings numbers, I mean, oh. the, the Nielsen ratings, but let's go with our personal ratings first. So, what was yours? Ah, uh, mine was a 3.25 peanut butter pot roast. Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> mine was a 3.4 out of 5 peanut butter pot roast. <laughs> Which just sounds disgusting. Danny is right. It's a human thing not eating that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we were trying to figure out what she cooked the last time that set off the smoke detector. It was french it fries with vanilla on them, right? Uh, it was, I think, hash browns with hash vanilla Hash browns extract. with vanilla extract. That's right. Yeah. I was close. Yeah. <laughs> Highly flammable vanilla extract. <laughs> I, I knew as soon as she said that she was cooking dinner for somebody that it was going to be a debacle. And then when I heard peanut butter pot roast, I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> I love how nonplussed everyone is about her food, too. The, like, Jess, Jesse just sat there and was like, okay, you know. And the other guy's like, I have a peanut allergy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not invited. <laughs> <laughs> like that would not be my concern <laughs> right so funny what were our numbers though so once again it didn't make the top 25 for the week or in live plus 3 I didn't see live plus 7 that was a bummer um, just in comparison so Game of Thrones was the live plus 3 winner and it had 11.6 million views in live plus 3 just to, put, just to put Preacher into perspective, and this is really a bummer, Alaska Bush People was number nine Aww. in the Live Plus Three, and it was 3.3 3 million. Oh my goodness. I know, right? <laughs> Stop watching that show. I know. And so Preacher actually did rank in the top 25 on Monday, July 17th, and it was 1.269 million same day. So... That is a real bummer. It is a bummer. I just, I know that we've got a season three and that makes me feel good, but I'm just really worried about Preacher. Yeah. So, but it's hanging in there. And I did see numbers about the episode that we're coming up on podcasting and it said something like Preacher holds its own with those numbers. So, God, I'm just clattering around all, all over the place tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so our writer was a guy named philip boozer that's what i would have said and um i thought it was kind of interesting he was a graduate of the cbs writers mentoring program i did see that so that's kind um, of how he got a leg up in the industry this is his only writing credits so far for Preacher, but he does have three producer credits. Uh, Damsels, Victor, and Sukasha, which is the next episode um, in the series. So, yeah, I don't know if it was his writing. This is just a really kind of downer episode all the way around, so I don't know if it was just the subject material or if it, you know, I don't know. Yeah, going back to your your kind of way of organizing things, I watched it and I was like, okay, middle book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
it was it there were we've we've said you know oh in this episode a lot happens but there's not a lot of forward momentum like in this episode nothing happens and there was like no forward momentum right. it was just dealing with tulip and victor and luckily um jesse and tulip kissed at the end like that was like it's saving grace if they were if they're still fighting in the next episode i'm gonna be upset yeah i'm glad that they kissed and made up at the end it yeah. was, uh, it was a, a hard episode to watch. It was hard to see them. It was hard to see mom and dad fighting, as you've said in the I was past. just going to say, I don't like it when mom and dad fight, yeah. and neither does Cassidy. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this guy, Philip Boozer, um, also has Bates Motel in his writing credits, and I've heard good things about that. You know, yet another one, another series that I've heard good things about that I haven't actually had the time or made the time to watch. Yeah, I think I'm a season behind on it. I think I, I we haven't watched anything this season, but we had watched up until that. And it was just one of those things where, you know, there's just so much on to watch that it's like, oh, we'll watch it later. We'll watch it later. We'll watch it later. And, you know, then you have like 13 unwatched episodes and, you know, you're like, oh, I have to take an entire day out of my life and <laughs> sit on the couch and do this. So I'm so. going to completely digress, but yet another thing that I'm adding to my, I should watch it someday. A friend of mine posted about a series called Free Rain, R-E-I-N, that's on Netflix. And it's apparently like directed at horse crazy teenage girls, which of course I'm just a few decades away from that, but I'm still horse crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> so if there are any horse crazy li listeners out there, Free Rain is supposed to be quite good. It sounds like it's got two seasons right now. Huh, I have never heard of it. Well, you know, Netflix Netflix is really they there's they've got another show coming out. Um I just oh, watched Atypical. I it was that it? It's the one about with, the kid with autism. Oh, or no, with, this is a different actually, one. Actually Asperger's. I think he's got high functioning autism. Um this is a different one. This he ha um Willem Dafoe is in it. Oh. He's yeah. Yeah, it looked really interesting. So I, Netflix is like really, really holding their own and doing well as far as um, coming up with original content. I agree. They are a contender. Yep. Oh, and I think I saw it as I was looking at uh, TV by the numbers to get our numbers for this week. I am pretty sure I saw an ad for Jessica Jones season two. I know, I know. That was I, such a good... That's probably one of my favorite Netflix originals. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got Hulu with stuff like Handmaid's Tale, Which you I know. I still like, have not watched because that would mean resubscribing to Hulu. But I need to <laughs> because I know it's going to freak the hell out of me. So do, do what my friend does and you just... Like, she doesn't watch um, Game of Thrones current She'll get it when the entire season like is out on HBO Go, and she'll get HBO for like one month, and, then and she'll watch, yeah, and then she'll watch all <laughs> Game of Thrones, and then cancel her HBO again. I keep <laughs> HBO because of Bill Maher. Yeah, I have to admit. Yeah, yeah, I do like a show. Um, so onward before we get political. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it's been a heck of a week. Let me tell you. <laughs> Well, geez, I mean, Politicon was on this weekend. So, like, the guys that I rely on for my Game of Thrones after show, like, they didn't post it until, like, 4 o'clock today. It was oh, torturous. No. Because they were <laughs> obsessed with they, Politicon or they were yeah, at Politicon? They were at Politicon. So, uh, yeah. Well, I've listened to a couple of things from Politicon and they've been pretty good. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, moving on to the director for Preacher. Let's get back on track, shall we? <laughs> um, guy named Michael Morris, and he has a Preacher credit in season one. He directed He Gone. Um, and he's done, got director credits for things like House of Cards, Bloodline, Kingdom, and another AMC series called Halt and Catch Fire. Yep. So, yeah, I kind of cruised around on his IMDb page, and this bloodline show which is a netflix series looks really interesting i, I might have to i can't remember what it's about tell me what it's about a uh, family of adult siblings find their past secrets and scars revealed when their black sheep of a brother returns home 
Hmm. Anybody yeah. famous in it? Uh, not re Sissy Spacek. Oh, not really. Yeah. Just Sissy Spacek. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's like she's like the sixth credit down. Chloe Sevigny. Oh, um, mm-hmm. um, John Leguizamo. He's like tenth down. They're obviously not. They're doing it in order of appearances, episode appearances, and not in uh, like how famous you are. Right. So, yeah. Huh. The other people I don't really recognize, but yeah, it looks really interesting. So I might have to check out more of uh, Michael's work. Another of the ad, another add to the uh, list of I'll get to it one of these days. Right. It'll probably like it'll probably be one of those where like my friend is actually one of my good friends is like, how have I not never watched an episode of How I Met Your Mother? This is the greatest show. You know, How I Met Your Mother has been off the air for like five years. I couldn't get into it. I guess that makes me a jerk. <laughs> you know, no, I actually I couldn't get into it either. And I love Neil Patrick Harris and Alyssa Hannigan. So I'm like, why? Why am I not like, why is this not working with me? So good. I don't feel so bad. Yeah. You know, some things just don't resonate with some people. Like I, I was not a Sex in the City kind of girl either. So not nah, me either. Yeah, I didn't identify with it, I guess. <laughs> I identify with, like, crazy preachers and zombies and right. uh, shows about black sheep to the family. Or shows about superheroes that are kind of dark. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> like Jessica Jones. Yeah. So did you have anything special for the title for this one? I mean, it's pretty obvious that it was about Jesse and Tulip's time in Dallas after the bank heist. Right, and after her miscarriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the nail head. Yeah. Yeah, I got nothing other than that. Nope, it was just very self-descriptive, like uh, the episode Victor. Right. Yeah. So, for featured cast member, before we go into that, I have to do a corrections corner, which I'm stealing from My Favorite Murder. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I said that Mark Harlick or Herlick played was actually the guy who played Victor. I think I, I said that in the last episode and I completely got it wrong. So it still was very meta. Mark Harlick actually played himself as the actor who played God, but he had nothing to do with Victor. That's right. Because Vic- Victor is Paul Ben Victor. You got it. Is that the person you thought we would do as as featured cast? Yeah. That's yeah. the person I did too. <laughs> He was really the only other cast member in the episode besides the uh, the snarky little stepdaughter. Right. Who I think we're going to see again. Yes. Yes. Because uh, I do believe this is Victor's last final episode. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I talk about that. I'm going to go there. But first, um, so featured cast, he was born as Paul Friedman. Paul Ben Victor actually means Paul, son of Victor. And his dad was a man named Mc- Victor Friedman. So that's where he came up with his stage name. And he's actually played a number of gangsters, including a Greek mobster um, on The Wire. Which I thought was super... Oh, go ahead. His very first credit was uh, Blood Vows, the story of a mafia wife. He played a... um, Oh, it says TV movie as Paul Ben Victor. So he got his start as kind of as a, a mafia dude. So, yeah. Yep. Well, and I thought it was interesting. So being on The Wire and having a big recurring role on The Wire, that's a crossover with The Walking Dead because Seth Gilliam and Lawrence Gilliard are both from The Wire. Ah. So that's kind of the AMC crossover there. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's kind of he's kind of one of those characters that – he stands out when he needs to, but he also blends in when, you know, it's it's part of his role. Like, I, you know, going through his acting credits, I'm like, I don't remember him in Tombstone, you know. But, but didn't you look uh, at his face and think, I just totally know that face from somewhere. I've seen that guy his, a bunch of times. His face and his voice. And his it, nose. It's just, <laughs> yeah. It's just he's he's very distinctive, but mm-hmm. also... You know, depending on his role, he can just kind of blend into the background because he's got a long history of credits. He does. He's Uh, got like 150 credits. 
Cagney and Lacey. My goodness. Yeah, that's going a bit back, isn't it? Yeah, he was on an episode of Doogie Howser, MD. Oh, my God. That's first. funny. I didn't yeah, see that I mean, skimming through it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But um, I think he's got 60 some odd movies to his credit. He's worked with a lot of big names, too. Clint Eastwood and Ben Affleck. Daredevil. De Niro. Uh, Kevin Hart and Will Ferrell in Grudge Match, which I have not seen. <laughs> My other half isn't a big uh, stupid movie fan. Oh, mine is. Uh, you and Nick should watch movies together sometime. <laughs> <laughs> you should see our Netflix history. It, it stuns even me. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, so I have to say, um, Paul Benton Victor was in one of my all-time favorite X-Files episodes. He was in Tombs, about Victor Tombs. Ooh. Yeah. I still remember that. I still have that guy's face in my my head, Victor Tombs' face in my head. Oh, that's funny. So, and he also had parts on NYPD Blue, True Detective, Castle. So he's been in quite a bit. Yeah. And yep. I actually was really bummed out that he had such a short run in Preacher, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't look like he's hurting for work. He has five things that are in either post or pre-production right now, so I won't weep for him. Right. I don't think he's suffering for work. I agree. And of course, all of them are, uh, he kind of sounds vaguely mafioso in those two. Vincent DeFranco, Anthony Petroselli, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Tony Maddie Scaramucci. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? I think I did. <laughs> He's coming up in uh, The Haunting on Long Island, The Amityville Murders. So, Ooh, that kind of gives yeah. me chills. Yeah. You know us and our horror movie. Yeah, that might be worth watching. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Uh, rest in peace, Victor. <laughs> right. <laughs> our character of the, uh, the episode. And, and good luck to you, Paul, Ben, Victor. Have a great career from here on out. And maybe we'll have to check out the Amityville movie. Although, you know, we might see, uh, we might see Victor in hell. We could. I was a little bummed that we didn't see hell this time. I was very bummed we didn't see hell this time. And, you know, I actually have to say, I was talking with you before we logged on and, uh, I'm not really sure if I liked this one as well as I liked last week. And I was kind of indifferent to last week. See, and, uh, you know, I, mean, I last week I, I loved the episode um, just for a, a bunch of random scenes that came up. But, well, and yeah, I really this... liked it all because of the hellscapes. So I, I actually well, think I, I probably liked last week better than I liked this week. I have a parallel of that coming up. So oh, uh, we should uh, probably go into our goods. What was your good? Well, mine was I liked the way that they reverse aged Jesse. I thought that they made him quite a bit softer. They made him look a little chubby around the middle just by dressing him differently. He was kind of sullen and kind of vacant. Unkempt hair. Right. And the hair was just different enough that it didn't look like Jesse now. And it just, the Jesse now has such a hard edge compared to the way that he was right after Dallas and right after the bank heist with Tulip. So I thought they did a great job. Um, making him seem younger and not the same person that he is now. No, definitely not. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't really, really pick up on that. Um, I was, it it was a little weird seeing Jesse, like, with couch lock all day and no direction. (laughs) Right? I just, yeah, that was not the Jesse that we're used to. No, the Jesse that we're used to is much more... I hate to keep saying hard around the edges, but he's harder around the edges and he's just, he's sharper. There's, there's a, not really a refinement in terms of being a refined character, but a refinement in terms of purpose and direction that there isn't. There's a 
Yeah, there's a fire in him that wasn't there. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. So what was yours? Mine, I had some very, I, my stuff was very minor. My, my, um, I, I love, uh, the little girl and now I can't remember her name. Allie. The, uh, Allie. I absolutely love Allie cause she like not a big kid person, never wanted them, don't have any, but like, I love smart Alec little kids. <laughs> cause that was, I was a smart Alec little kid. So you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say that. I'm glad you did. <laughs> When when Tulip was like, "Who loves booberry?" and she's like, "That's just a bunch of chemicals." Right. I, I would be the smart alecky adult to look back and be like, "All food is chemicals." <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you just have a moment where you could see Tulip and Cassidy as her parents? Yes. Oh, Cassidy would make the greatest dad. He would he make would a be, great dad. Yeah, yeah, he, and it's come to find out he's been married. Um, and loved it, but, uh, when yeah. Did, when I, did he say that? I completely missed that. Uh, when he was sitting on the bed talking to Jesse. Oh, cause I remember he said, talked about being rich and that he really enjoyed being rich, but I missed the whole oh, married thing. Maybe I misheard. Maybe he was rich for a time, time and loved it. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, I was actually very, very distracted with his obsession with foreskin softness. <laughs> did you catch that? I did, and I was wondering if I misheard it because I was kind of like, oh. I think because, like, the whole ice cream joke in the Mumbai Tower with right? the angel and, like, they were talking about how many foreskins or whatever it would take they, to make ice cream They were talking about soft. face cream. Face cream, yes. that's what, yeah. Like, but I, I was like, he's obsessed with the softness of <laughs> like, so I think that scene must have thrown me and I may have misheard so he talked about being rich and he talked about enjoying being rich yeah okay but did you catch another thing and I'm totally like taking away from your good and going into my the... good was very very tiny I just love the snarky little girl <laughs> well so and I'm... we're gonna see more of her hopefully I hope so too yeah yeah so what was what was your well, so this is still relating to your good, kind of, but I have to say this now while I'm thinking about it. Did you notice that Cassidy knew about Victor before the reveal at the end of last episode? Because yeah, when I, he and I... Tulip are talking, she she's actually like, you know, I told you and I told you not to tell him. And, you know, then she kind of launched into a description of Victor as her husband and and Jesse as her boyfriend. And, and like, like Cassidy knew it before before she left to try to find Victor last episode. And I was like, how was did it... I miss that? That was huge. Wasn't that something in the Mumbai hotel when she clear when she killed the uh, the guy that came looking for her? But I didn't think didn't... she told Cassidy that she was married. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Now we're gonna have to rewatch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. So I don't know if it... Jesse brought back the papers, so I don't know if they're legally divorced or if she's widowed. Um, I don't um, think she needs to be divorced now because she's widowed. <laughs> yeah. Which, does that give her, like, custody of the little girl? Well, I think it would depend on whether or not Victor had made any other arrangements and whether or not the little girl has any other family. You would think he's a mobster and, like, you know, he, you know, is kind of waiting for somebody to come kill him. Hopefully he had all of his affairs in order. Let's hope. If not, we might have our Judith of this series. <laughs> we'll always be like, where's the little girl? Where's the little girl? Who's watching her? Uh, and she's off poking a biker with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your job? What was your bad? Uh, okay, and here's where the parallel comes in. I absolutely loathe jesse's hell loop so what is that's jesse's what hell i loop? kind of because i think i missed that too that's what i equated it with is you know how in um the episode damsels i think it was damsels 
the the previous episode where we kept seeing uh, Eugene's hell Victor. on a loop. We kept seeing his hell on a loop in oh, right. Okay, in Victor. in Victor. Yeah. Okay, we kept seeing his hell on a loop, and so that to me sort of like Jesse went through that. Oh, in, like that, walking back and forth between the yeah the. The convenience, convenience store, store and getting a six pack and a pregnancy, a pregnancy test. test and and a carton of cigarettes and you know then walking home having like unsatisfying sex with Tulip um, and doing the pregnancy test and then doing it all over again and again and again and again. I like that. That's a really good catch. I didn't even think about it in that context. Yeah, so it really, it seemed like his hell loop. And I was just like, oh, that's the most depressing hell loop ever. It was pretty I, depressing. I think I would rather have a girl I love shoot herself in the head and then me shoot myself in the head. Like, <laughs> rather have a Sid and Nancy out, would you? <laughs> <laughs> or at the very least, a nice brunch with Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that was just the most depressing hell loop, you know, that he went through. And so I, I just thought that the parallel to that was interesting. But, you know, it was awful in that it was just so depressing. I so, agree. Yeah. What a good, good uh, parallel. I like that very much. Yeah. Well, so what was yours? Mine was that I didn't like Victor being collateral damage. Oh, you didn't like Victor getting killed in the end? It was depressing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just, I, it wasn't just that he got killed by the Saint of All Killers in the end, although that, of course, is, is ultimately what was kind of the finale for him. But just, you know, seeing him... Not really tortured, but roughed up by Jesse and seeing him kind of lose to Jesse and to Tulip. I just didn't like that that he was collateral damage in their relationship. And then he ends up dying as a result of the cowboy looking for Jesse and Tulip. Yeah. Um, that it Of all the things that would kill him, you know, it would be their relationship. I mean, the guy's you know, a mobster who, who, you know, doesn't do nice things with nice people and, you know, sleeps with, you know, machine guns or whatever under his bed. Right. And I, I know it wasn't a machine gun. I'm just using that term uh, generally. It was like some uh, heavily automated pistol. Where is our munitions expert when we need him? Right. <laughs> um. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, Victor's story was, was probably going to come to a bloody end anyway, but to have it be a direct result of, you know, Tulip and Cassidy and, and Jesse and the saint and everything. Um, I, I really hope that uh, they don't kill Allie, like whether or not she joins the, our, our little trio. Uh, I like, yeah, I, I, I'm always don't kill the dog, but, yeah, don't kill Allie. I have to tell you, when they showed the, the Saint of All Killers kind of coming up to her, I thought, this will be a test for him. Will he kill a child? Oh, he killed, the, in his hell loop, he killed right. children. He killed all those children yeah. in the school. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But it it was one of those moments where I thought, is he going to do it? And then, of course, he didn't. But because she could give him what he was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that'll what, be interesting to see. What was your revelation? Um, that's kind of our ugly, isn't it? Where it's kind of a, a again, mine is so minor. <laughs> the only like point of levity in the show. I love when Cassidy walked into Victor's house. And he pushes over the guy that's been frozen for like right. a day and a half. <laughs> like, and his little laugh, it just, it, it made me kind of snicker a little bit. So the, it was the only mo moment of true levity in the in the show. And this is a really down episode for me. So yeah, we talked about, talked about how there weren't any laugh out loud moments. 
Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it made me snicker. So uh, you leave it to Cassidy to, to do something goofy in such a serious moment, you know? So that was my little one. Well, mine kind of plays a little bit into that only because of what I said about Cassidy at the end of my little rant about Revelation. So it, this just really reinforced my worry that neither Jesse nor Tulip is a good person. I mean, they both were just really not nice and not good people in this episode. And that was hard to swallow because I love these characters so much. Isn't it funny that the vampire is the guy with all of the heart and soul and good intentions, you well, know? And and that's what I wrote. I wrote, Cassidy has the best heart in this. And then I wrote, he's loyal to a fault, which I know is is a cliche. But, I mean, there he is at the end saying, Jesse, whatever you decide to do, I back you 100%. And yeah. he's like the only good person, the only genuinely good person in this whole series well and when he and tulip are having their little fight and you know she punches him to the ground or whatever and um he's like i love you know i love you both right you know you're both my friends and i you know that i truly believe that i think if if we were anybody other than jesse he would be trying for tulip but because he's such a good friend of jesse you know that's jesse's woman so so yeah. that leads right into the word, into kind of the, the details of the episode. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we have seen the last of Cassidy trying for Tulip? I don't know. I want to say yes. But I don't think they're, you know... I don't think there's not a possibility. I kind of feel like we've seen the last of it because Jesse said, you've been lying to me this whole time and basically revealed that he knew about Cassidy and Tulip. I kind of got that feeling, but there was no overt, you slept with her or I know what you two did or, you know, but they have been keeping little secrets from Jesse. So yeah, I don't know if he knows directly what happened between the two of them. I totally feel like even though he didn't say exactly you two slept with each other behind my back, that that's totally what he was referring to. I think yeah. he knows. And I think that, that him basically saying, you know, why should I trust you? I just think that kind of puts, puts paid to Cassidy going after Tulip. And even Cassidy was like, oh, you know, there'll never be a, a time when there's not a Tulip and Jesse. Yes. Yes. And it was funny. I like in uh, rewatching that episode. I was like, you know, he's like, oh, I didn't come here to talk you out of anything, which is what everyone always says. Right. You know, <laughs> when they're trying to talk you out of something. But he legitimately and, and like Jesse's like, if I do this, she's gone. And mm -hmm. uh, Cassidy's like, they'll never not be a Tulip and Jesse, you know? So, like, he really wasn't, like, w I don't know if he was, like, egging him on to do it. Or just the whole, I stand behind whatever you do because you're my friend. I think he was sincere. I think it was, I will stand behind you whatever you do because you're my friend. Yeah. I don't think there was any ulterior motive. Yeah. Yeah, I, this I I really did not like this little side mission. I need to I think we need to get back to searching for God and and the the men in the white suit, the government men in the white suits and uh finding Eugene. Well, we still have 137 bars to look at in New Orleans, so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they need to uh get off of Victor at this point. Mm -hmm. Which of course, you know, Victor's gone now anyway, so now we're just avoiding the saint. Right. Which it sounds like in this next episode, they'll confront the saint or the saint will confront them. Yeah. In that grimy kitchen. Right. <laughs> like hey, so I did really like, this is a little off the saint, but I liked having Danny come back and I liked 
just how snarky and awful she was when they had dinner with her right after Dallas. I love that. Yes. She's just such a miserable character. <laughs> <laughs> Not... Not made any better by Tulip's cooking, No, by the way. I love that she's like, I'm angry enough. I don't need dessert. Right. I don't need to scrub dessert. And I love that she was trying to get her husband killed yet again. Or as I said <laughs> before, before actually we saw her trying to get her husband killed the first time. <laughs> Every time we see her, she's trying to get Tulip to kill her husband. Yes. Um, did you notice that uh, the in one of our files, um, it, it, it was, was Victor's Victor. picture? Yes. Yeah, the guy in Dallas with some work for them. So she is totally the reason that Victor and Tulip met. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then we find out that Tulip has been lying to Jesse and actually only worked for the, the realty company for three, three weeks. <laughs> hey, so what was with the birth control? So she was not conceiving because she was contracepting. I mean, yeah. she basically was lying to Jesse about about wanting to have a child with him after everything that happened in Dallas. And I think what it was, I think it was symbolic of a loss of faith in him. You think? I do. I mean, I think that she just really was kind of feeling like maybe that wasn't the right path that she wasn't invested in being with him and being part of a family and she even said it she said i'm an o'hare i don't know how to do it well but then she goes to victor and you know she plays house with him you know she's got the white dress and the veil and but i think you know, victor was right i think he said i was nice to her yeah and I think yeah, maybe I just, for a little bit she was actually insulated until she got that call about Carlos. Yeah, I just I I figured that she had been doing work for Danny on the side, mm -hmm. but the um the pills the the birth control pills just that one threw me for a loop because it seemed I mean. They were trying very unenthusiastically, but they were trying really hard. <laughs> well, but obviously she wasn't. She was trying to keep Jesse keep and up. to keep this life, but she wasn't really invested in it. No, not at all. And I think I maybe her time with Victor was actually a chance not to be Tulip O'Hare for a little bit. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. I think she, if she'd have never gotten the call from Danny, if, if Danny had never found Carlos, I think she could have just gone on. I do too. I think she would still be with Victor and I think she would be a mafioso's wife. Yep. Yep. Which, I mean, that's why this was an important middle book, right? Because it gave us the idea of how they got back together after, da after Dallas and how Jesse ended up with his dad's church and it, it kind of built those storylines a little bit. Right. And what's funny is uh with them talking about uh um him going back to the church, uh I'm kinda of wondering if we'll see some flashbacks of Anvil. We might. I, I think your idea that we might see some of the citizens of Anvil and Hell are probably more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few of them deserve to be there. Yeah, I'm totally down with seeing Donnie and his wife there. <laughs> uh, the guy on the bus. I can never remember his name. Uh, Linus. Yes. Yeah. I want to see Linus. That would be fine. I could see Linus in hell. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What else? Oh, so you ha said you had some numbers. But um, before you no. do, I just have one okay. little thing. So did you notice that Jesse's buddy, Reggie, kept ripping the page out of the Bible? They kept showing that over yes. and over again. Yep. So it was the beginning of the Epistle of James. Yes, and I had never heard of that because I was like, isn't that apostle? Like, why is that word start with an <laughs> Oh, it's a letter. I... It's a letter. Yeah. So I looked it up because it looked like they they kept going to the beginning of the Epistle of James over and over again. And the, the end of the first chapter says the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
And it says in, in the first chapter, one who doubts should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Mm. So I think that that actually refers to both Jesse and Tulip. I mean, Jesse's, yeah. the testing of Jesse's faith produces perseverance and Tulip is our doubter. Yep. And then it, it, definitely. chapter two ends with faith without deeds is dead. So it just is going, oh, it go, chapter two basically goes over and over again about how, yeah, you can have faith, but you need to demonstrate it with your works as well. Hmm. So it, I just thought it was interesting that they kept flashing back to that particular moment. Um, that's funny. It kind of has a little bit of... Uh... The when Victor was reading the paper, he was saying that the Dow is up forty six points, right. and oh. Psalms Psalms forty six is God is our refuge and and strength and ever present help in trouble. So, so there's definitely quite a bit of stuff, and again, I think this is is much of this is intentional about just being soothed in times of trouble, right. <clears throat> Um, the sign that Jesse kept walking back in front of in, in the church, uh, when he was going to get beer and pregnancy tests, <laughs> um, which Diane and I were so hoping would be a funny snarky sign, but they did not have anybody that would change the letters to make yes. it funny. Snarky. We both said we missed the sign in front of the church. <sighs> so awful, but bingo on Thursdays. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the... Prayer group times were 9.15, 10.30, and 7. And um, Hebrews 9.15, for this reason Christ is the mediator of new content, of, of new covenant. Those who call the, may receive the promise of internal inheritance now that he has died as ransom is to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Oh my God, would you please make some sense of that in the context of Preacher? <laughs> so he, she, Tulip talked about how your snooty stuck up father and, you know, this kind of thing. And then he's like, my, you know, I still have my dad's church is my inheritance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so he, I think he wanted to be set free from his sins um, that, have been committed so he was going to go back to his father's church so you think he was trying to take refuge from what they did in dallas and from the outcome of their trip to dallas yep okay that's interesting yep. he received the promise of eternal eternal inheritance oh yeah. yeah and then um john ten thirty, i am the father i and the father are one that could be Jesse and his dad. That could be God. That could be Genesis. Genesis. Yep. Yep. And I didn't find anything for the seven o'clock hour. Anything that kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So there's were my numbers. Did you have a and chance to go? I'm putting you on the spot, but did you have a chance to go back and look at Eugene's number? I didn't. No, I, I haven't either. I just thought of that now while we were talking. But that would be something worth looking at in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wrote it down somewhere. See, I wrote down 725. And I thought you said that there were only two numbers. Right. There's a, basically what looks like a telephone number as a prefix. Right. Which is... 376721. Uh, I think that's right. 376 is the first three. Of course, now I can't find it. <laughs> yeah, it's 3763211. Or no, I'm sorry, 3762117. Okay, so two oh, so the last number is 25. So Hmm. Psalms 25, in the Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust you, do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one will hope in you, 
no one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come to those who are treacherous without cause. Hmm. It goes on from there. So I'm just looking up symbolism of the number 25. Which... Meaning of the number 25 in the Bible... Number 25 in the Bible symbolizes grace upon grace. It is comprised of 20, meaning redemption, and 5, grace, or grace multiplied, 5 times 5. Oh, grace and redemption, our poor, undeserving of hell, Right, right. Who's now, who's being tortured and with no hope of being saved because uh, our trio is looking for God. And because we don't know what happened to the angels. Right. Or I mean, we kind of do, but yeah, it, that's kind of... And even if he is saved, he has nothing to go back to. For good or for bad. Right, I mean, because Angel you know. is destroyed. Yeah, so his, I mean, the the pain of, of growing up and living in that town and what happened there and, and you know, the shame and everything, it's... I mean, the the good has gone along with the bad, so he can he could start over if he gets out of hell. Interesting, grace and yes. redemption. Okay, I like that. Yeah, yeah, very fitting. I uh, I really want to see more of hell. I think we're going to see more of hell. Hell, <laughs> I, I'm hoping that we're going to go back there next episode. Yeah. Which is really funny. Here I'm saying, I hope we're going back to hell. But, you know, when I, when I compared this episode to last week's, I actually liked hell better. Yeah. Hell, <laughs> hell is an interesting place. Yeah. I mean, hell definitely has some, uh, some good things to offer. Yeah. So did you think that uh, Jesse had killed Victor when he cut him down? No. I knew that he was going to cut him down. Did you, were you convinced at all? Uh, only because Tulip was like, she thought he had cut him down, like mowed him down on the road, like cut him down. And it's like, no, I cut the straps off and let him go, you know, but she had me convinced for a second. And what does that say about Jesse that she immediately thought the worst? Or what does that say about her and Jesse that she immediately thought the worst? I don't think Victor was that good of a guy. I mean, he no. was egging him on. Yeah, so. no, I don't think Victor was a very nice guy either. But I don't know. It just goes back to I'm kind of bummed that neither Jesse nor Tulip is a particularly good human being. <laughs> yeah, or trusting of each other. After everything that they've been through. But I also think it goes back to what we thought about Genesis last season, which is that, you know, the priest or preacher in Africa was too good and the magister in in uh, this in Russia was too evil. And so Jesse was a perfect blend of good and evil and human, which was why Genesis was able to stay in Jesse and why right. Jesse was able to host him. And yeah, right. Definitely. Definitely. Well, I don't know that I've got a whole heck of a lot else. Do you? No, I don't. So what did you say the next episode was called? Uh, the next episode, I think it's called Sukasha. Okay. S-O-K-O-S-H-A. Hmm. I wonder if that's a something significant in Russian. I don't remember my Russian well enough to know. Or if it's just someone's name. Uh, the first line of the synopsis is a Japanese technician explains a medical procedure to a husband and wife and informs them they can get double their money's worth if they opt for the 15%. The husband signs the agreement. So. Okay, maybe Sukasha is Japanese. <laughs> and that's a that big was... departure from anything we've seen so far. <laughs> Mumbai Sky Tower, a mafia dude named Victor. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, good. We'll see. Yeah. But it does 
it does look like we have a um encounter with the saint of killers so yes, that's what it seems like next episode kind of looks maybe like a maybe more exciting than this one i wonder if they'll resolve that storyline the saint mm-hmm. you don't think it's gonna last the entire season well, I will be surprised if they finish up that storyline, but this series is nothing if not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we are done for the night. All right. We, we are getting caught up. So till next time. Till the end of the world till the end of the world. I left his body